there and welcome to our session that we're going to go through together with you. And this session is going to involve business etiquette and emails. All the things that you want to know about emails will be contained in this program. And as you know, emails are probably the most effective way that we communicate in business today. If you are a manager, if you are an executive, indeed, emails are now changing the way that we do business. And also, emails come with them a lot of expectations. Emails are very quick as well. And therefore, there are a lot of things concerning emails that business people do need to understand. Not only how to write an email, but all the things that go together with making that email a very powerful tool in business. You can be connected to the world in an instant with your emails. You can write to customers and talk to your vendors and talk to your staff, etc., all through email. So emails are the way that most of us are communicating in the written form. There are, of course, other different types of letters and things that we do use, the standard post, the standard letters, etc. However, when we are looking to be very effective and very efficient now in business, emails are our main way of corresponding. So if that is the case, then it means we do need to put great emphasis on how we deal with emails. We need to understand them. We need to know how powerful they can be. We need to know how they can sometimes get us into trouble. So in this program, we'll go through every aspect of emails step by step. So you get a thorough understanding of how they can be useful in your business. There is a quote by a famous American educator, Dale Carnegie, and he made this quote uh, some time ago, he said that there are four ways and only four ways in which we have contact with the world. We are evaluated and classified by these four contacts. And they are what we do, how we look, what we say, and how we say it. So Dale Carnegie is meaning here that communication and the way we communicate is going to have an impression on the person that we're sending that communication to. And we are evaluated and classified simply by our communication ability. What we do, how we look, what we say, and how we say it. And emails are a very powerful form of exactly how we say things and what we say. Emails as well can reflect what we do and how we look and how we behave as well. So this means that emails and letter writing and communication as a whole can either make or break you in business. It is that powerful. And when you think about the number of emails that come to you every day, it could be 10, 20, 50, it could be more than that. When you think of how you need to reply to those emails, think of the number of people you are affecting. Think of the number of people who are trying to gain an image of you through the way that you handle your emails and how you come across in your emails. So this means that there is certain etiquette that needs to be followed to make sure that you can be very effective. Just as there is etiquette to follow in how we behave in front of other people, there is also etiquette to follow in how we deal with emails. And once you can master this etiquette and know all about each step in the etiquette, then you are on the way to being a very successful communicator through emails. So as I said in my opening in this program, when it comes to your business and really uh, your business email communications, 
you do need to make an impression. And this impression can lead the receiver of your emails to decide whether you are credible, whether you are a professional enterprise, and indeed whether you are someone that will be easy and a pleasure actually to do business with. People can feel this and know this purely from your email. You only have one chance to make that impression. We have discussed that making an impression is very, very important to how you can build relationships after that. And therefore, your first impression that you make in an email will be an asset to building trust and to building confidence with the partners that you hope to make from your email communications. So you can build a lot of things together in your email so that other people get a very good first impression. It's only one chance and you can blow it or you can destroy that chance if you are not careful. So it's time now that you as a businessman or a, an executive, as a manager, etc. It's time now that you really take notice of emails. Give them very, very due regard. They are not just a quick way of communicating. Emails are much more powerful than that. So we're going to go through in this program some key business email etiquette issues. And these are things that maybe have been in the back of your mind for some time. Perhaps you have thought a little bit about them or maybe not thought about them at all. But we're going to highlight them in this first program. So you can consider them with every single email from this day on that you send. These are issues that business owners, if you're a business owner or employees of a company or metropreneurs uh, need to be aware of every day, every day in their online communications so that they're going to get the absolute best results. That's what you're aiming for, isn't it? Success and the best results. So we're going to move on now to the basics and we will go through other matters also later in the program about all the other facets of email. First up, your professional behavior on the job. Please really have it in your mind that you understand how to use your emails, your company email address and your employer's technology. It's important that you know how to use these things very, very well. If you send non-business related emails or jokes, or you send chain letters or letters that are nonsense. If you do this when it's on company time to friends or to co-workers, then this reflects your lack of professionalism in your job. I know it's very tempting. Sometimes you feel like you want to play around with the computer a little bit to take a break. But do remember that this is not professional behavior. Be careful how you regard the facility that you have in your business or in the company that you work for. If you wish to be professional, then you stay professional all the time. And you do not use your company's property, your company's technology, to use it for personal use, for fun, for joking around. So this is something that you need to get into your mindset straight away. Also, be very careful if you are using your company internet and visiting websites that are perhaps a little bit questionable and really don't uh, relate to your particular job responsibilities, then this will also reflect very badly on you. And people will know that you're not really actually to be trusted. You look around, you use the company's time, the company's technology to visit websites that you're interested in and are actually not really relevant to your work. Do remember this point. Many companies now are taking very strict note of this because this kind of activity is not only a time-wasting activity, but it also endangers the company itself. 
there are many uh, organizations that do survey what sites are being uh, visited and what questionable sites are being visited as well. So please do be very, very careful of this. I know for a fact certain sites and companies prohibit visiting questionable sites. And if you find that uh, your staff member or you do this, then that is seen in a very poor way. Never assume that these activities that you are undertaking are not being monitored by somebody, as I said. You might think, oh, I'm just going to have a look for five minutes. No one will know. Well, that is a very incorrect way for you to think and behave because sites are monitored. The internet and organizations now that are set, set up in security and monitoring is a very big business. And so people are out there monitoring sites all the time. So take it as a rule. While on company time, do not assume you have any privacy when using company resources and equipment. This is something that you must put first and foremost in your mind if you want to be professional, a professional employee in your organization. And I might add here too that your organization expects much better of you. So do you realize that this is not good behavior to use company time to search for personal interests? So this is a very important first basic about email etiquette and it needs to be impressed upon everybody very, very strongly. Next up, quite simply, the subject field, which is the field that we go to immediately to know what the email is about as well as the sender. We like to look at this field because it is the window into your email. So you can get an idea of whether that email is worth opening or not. Basically, that's what we look at quickly when we get 50 emails in one shot. We look at the subject field to see whether, uh-huh, I'll open it. No, I won't. I'll leave it till later. So this is an important part of the email. If this is the initial contact with a customer based on a request through your site or whatever, then be sure to have a short subject so that you indicate very, very clearly what the topic of the email is. So if you are not careful with the way you type in your subject, you might be considered to be a spam. And then people will delete and forever delete and block you as the sender ever sending an email again. So do think carefully about the subject. Regard how you look at somebody's emails being sent to you and the subject, and at the same time, regard very carefully what you type in to the subject field. Make sure there are no spelling mistakes. Make sure there are no all caps or small case, so it looks like it's somebody who's not knowing what they're doing. This will give the impression of it being spam. So first up, be professional. Second up, that subject field. That is an important area. So do take very special attention with typing in the subject in a professional sense. In the basics of email etiquette, we also do need to look at the level of formality. So therefore, try not to simply think because it's email, it allows you to be informal in your business email. Consider this point. Because it's email and you're not writing on a letterhead, which indicates a formal kind of approach to correspondence, then sometimes we think that it's informal and therefore we don't regard it in a proper way. Well, this is something you need to rethink. There still is a le level of formality even if you're just writing on the back of a reply or an, an incoming message that you received from someone in business. You can make mistakes and 
think that because you don't see a letterhead, because it's you're not actually typing something up separately and being formal with it, you can fall into this trap. So your relationship building efforts with the other party in an email can guide you to understand when you can formalize your business relationships and therefore your email's tone. So that means whatever the relationship is that you have with that customer, for example, or that business partner, that relationship will indicate to you how formal you should be or how informal to a certain degree you can be. You must always think when you are replying in business that you're reflecting your company. Just because you can't see your company letterhead, that doesn't mean you are not replying on behalf of your company. So the best way you can approach this and keep things, things formal is to understand that every reply in business, every reply to your customers or to your partners or potential partners, etc., is always on letterhead. Try to put this thinking in your mind. This is your business's image that you are branding by the words in your email. So as a general rule, think, every email I write in terms of business, I'm writing it on behalf of my company and it is formally on behalf of my company. So communicate as if your company letterhead is there at all times. One of the next basics in email etiquette is the way you address things. So it's very, very important to address things, particularly also for new contacts, at the highest level of courtesy. Always aim to be very courteous right from the beginning with new people, new contacts. You could, for example, say hello, or you could say dear in the traditional letter writing style. Hello, Mr. Anderson, for example, or dear Ms. Jones, or dear Dr. Osborne, etc. So just keep those formal approaches there because you won't really offend anybody if you maintain that level in your addressing. Later on, if your new contact says, oh, please just call me Andy, or you can call me Diane. If your new contact says that, then by all means you can begin to approach them and address them that way when you write to them. So you'll be able to pick up on this in the body of their replies as to when you can address them in a more relaxed way. Also, look at the way that they sign off their letter to you or their email. Look at the way they sign off. If they sign off in a very formal way, they could sign off sincerely yours or very best regards or uh, yours faithfully in a traditional letter style. If they sign off that way, that means they are inclined to be quite formal. However, if they sign off in a more informal way, some people say, uh, thank you, see you next time, or I enjoyed talking to you, let's catch up again soon, or see you later. Things like this, they are more informal. So you can get an indicator as to how they address you and how they sign off. It's interesting to remember too that most business people, they don't mind being called by their first name. However, sometimes in the international sense of things, that can be perceived as being a little bit too friendly too quickly in a relationship, particularly a new relationship. So do wait until they let you know if you can address them by their first name. This is important as it reflects your image of professionalism 
all the time. That is what you are trying to do. Make a great impression and reflect your image and your company's image as well. Now we look at the to part of the email setup. To and from. Blind CCs, CC copying fields can make or break you. In the to field, always make sure you have your contact's name formally typed. John B. Doe, for example, not John B. Doe in smaller case or John B. Doe in full uppercase. Really make sure that you correctly type in the person's name. This otherwise can be perceived as to be quite rude or impolite. So do be very careful how you type in people's names. It's just like when you speak to someone. If you say their name incorrectly or you mispronounce it, that can be a little bit offensive in some ways. So do be careful with the to field and how you type in the correct spelling of someone's name. In the field of from, in this field, make sure that you have your name formally typed. And that's important too, both the name of the person you're sending to and also your name. Names are very important. For example, Jane A. Jones. You can don't type in Jane A. Jones or Jane A. Jones in smaller case, lower case or upper case. The same thing applies. So here you need to slow down and be careful and watch this part of your email. Not only the body of your email that's important, the to and the from fields also are important as well. These two give the perception of whether you have a good education or not, whether you have limited experience or not as well with technology. So therefore, you are reflecting your professionalism or lack of professionalism just by these two fields. If you just put in your first name, people might think that's a bit dodgy. That might be uh, something too slack or too familiar and therefore they don't really know why you're just using your first name. So be very careful. People will start to suspect you if you're just using your first name, even if you know each other very well, as a matter of formality in business emails. Always put in the full name, correctly spelled, and using upper and lower case, not just lower and not just upper. Blind CCs, the blind CC field. If you are emailing a group of contacts and this group of contacts don't really know each other, they don't really know each other very well. So by listing a long lengthy list of email addresses in the CC or two fields of contacts who don't really know each other, who've never really met as well, is like publishing the email to a group of strangers. Do you really want to know to let all those strange people who don't know each other have all this information? Remember, this is a privacy issue. Even though they may be trying to forge partnerships with you, visibly listing their names and email addresses in with a group of strangers will make the people that you're trying to do business with wonder whether you are considering their privacy and respect them or understand them. Be careful not to offend the people that you're directly communicating with. Don't let a whole lot of other strangers be involved in this. So do be very careful here. Don't offend the people that you're writing to. And if you do want to send things and list them in the blind CCs, then go ahead, but don't list them in the open 
copying or two fields. This really may have a negative effect on the person you're corresponding with. It's the same for you. You really don't want to see your personal and private emails with your business partners going to a whole lot of other people. So bear this in mind. Respect the privacy issue. I know that when I've received emails that are coming to me and I see there's a whole stack, an endless list of people on the CCs and I think, well, why on earth are they being CC'd? This issue is only between myself and the manager of the marketing uh, section that I'm talking to. Why are there eight other people involved in this? What's their concern? What's their involvement? And this does make you sit back and think about whether the person you're corresponding with directly really understands the point, really has some respect for you. So this is something to remember. When you copy, it's usually only when there are a handful of, so of associates, as I said, involved in a discussion. And it means that everybody's involved and they're all going to have some input into this particular issue. These people know each other. They may be in the same department or different departments or the, some different levels, but they know each other. They've been introduced to each other. And they don't mind having their email address included so other people can see. So if you are not sure if a business associate, associate would mind their address being made public, then ask them. Simply ask them. Simply ask, would you mind if I include you on the list that I copy to? This is something you need to establish right from the beginning when you're beginning to communicate by email. When you establish your modus operandi or the way you're going to communicate together, you need to ask who you directly address things to, who you copy to as well, who is in the list of CCs, and clearly establish that right from the beginning. Therefore, you won't have any problems later on. So do make sure of this point, because it will really reflect your image of professionalism. Next, we come to another basic and that is formatting. So here, when you format, unless you are going to type something in very bright red letters on business letterhead, don't do it when you're emailing somebody in business. The same thing applies. Don't play with formatting. You do need to refrain from using formatting that might make your email look like a spam. Be very, very careful here. You do not want people to think that it's spam simply by the way it shows up and is formatted. So the rule here is to try to keep things very, very simple. Don't try to be too creative. Don't try to put in colors or fonts or things that are going to make it look like it's not a serious business email. There's a lot of spam filtering going on today. And sometimes when images are embedded in letters, there's a high chance actually that your email could be blocked as spam. So you don't want that happening at all. So the best rule that you can follow, even something as simple as using a different font, makes your email's display dependent upon whether that receiver has a specific font to be able to read it in their system. Sometimes you might receive emails that end up with just boxes all through them because you don't have the font that that sender sent the email in. So try to keep things simple. Remember that the recipient may not have their email program configured in such a way as to display your formatting the way it appears on your system. So do remember this point, that you do have to take regard of who you're sending the email to and whether they're going to be able to actually open it up in the way that you have sent it. 
So as a general rule with formatting, keep it simple. Don't go overboard with strange fonts or embedding images, etc. Otherwise, your email may not actually be able to be read. Next, we come to another important basic of email etiquette. And this concerns attachments. Everybody sends attachments these days. And do you really think before you send that attachment? Do you think of the content or how that might be perceived? Do you think any more about it or do you just blindly send it off and hope for the best? How do you think also when that attachment you send, if it's a very large file, say you send them a 10 megabyte PowerPoint presentation, do you really think how the receiver might feel if suddenly he realizes that incoming mail includes a 10 megabyte file? They didn't request it, but you're filling their inbox up, causing perhaps real business concerns with their email reception. And maybe it could cause things to bounce back as undeliverable. So the point I'm trying to make here is try to think of the other person at the other end. Unless they have requested a very large file, then please just don't automatically send off large things because you think they might want it. Their system may not be able to cope. They actually may not be very happy about receiving large files. It could be that their security system questions whether they do, in fact, receive files of that size. Your relationships could get a bit rocky here. And this is an actual point that happens. People get angry. They ring the other person up and say, why did you send me that file? It locked up my system. I can't do anything now for another hour. Or I've got to get the technician in. Or my inbox is full. I've got to do something. You'll find that that can damage your relationship. So please, do be very careful with attachments. And do remember, if they don't have PowerPoint, they wouldn't be able to open the file anyway. So when you're emailing, etiquette, email etiquette is very important in this sense. You have to think of the receiver. You have to put yourself in their shoes. So never assume that your potential customers or the people that you are writing to always have the software you do to open any file that you may just arbitrarily send to them. Never assume that. I have heard many complaints from people in this particular situation where they get so angry that, again, this person has sent attachments that they're not really wanting and they never asked for. So there are some things we do need to remember about attachments. If you need to send a very large file or indeed if you need to send a combination of files that are very big in size, then you should realize that you need to ask the recipient first if it's okay to send such a large file. Is it all right? Will they be able to accept it? Do they mind? It's something that could be of interest to them. Do they want to receive it? So always go ahead and ask first. Next, you can check whether they have the same software and version that you do, and what might be also an appropriate time of day to send that file, to ensure that if it is a large file, if it is a big file, then they can receive it and they can also keep their email flowing. Sometimes businesses have a lot of traffic during the day, and this is something you do need to think about. There might be certain hours of the day where the traffic flow on the uh, email system is very high. There are peaks and troughs in some types of businesses. So you need to find out when it is reduced so then you can get in there and send large files without upsetting the whole system. So communicate. Talk to your, your partner, your business contact. Ask them. 
email them and ask them, or you can pick up the phone occasionally too and talk through this with them. So never send large attachments without warning. This is a very good general rule to follow. And on weekends or after business hours, there also may not be anybody there to keep their inbox clear. So don't assume that you'll send it late at night or 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning or on a Sunday morning. Don't assume that because you're sending it then too, that it will be able to get through. It may not be able to. So the point is, always communicate. Always ask and find out first. And then write this down in your list of protocols in the way that you're going to operate with emails with that particular customer. There's nothing worse than getting undeliverable or failure notices on emails. That wastes your time. It wastes everybody time and it becomes very, very frustrating because you're trying to work out why, then you have to go to the error report and then you're uh, beginning to get stressed because you can't get this information to the other person. They may not want it anyway. So here you need to communicate first, find out the protocol. So sometimes we have habits too. If you are using email, we fall into habits of how we actually use email. And if you want to give the impression that you're a little bit lazy, then you go ahead and you find out a previous email, or you look for a previous email from the party you want to communicate with. And you hit reply and start ty typing something that's not really relevant to the old email that you're typing on the back of. This kind of thing reflects a little bit of laziness in your image and the way you approach email writing. Really, if you've got a new subject to talk about, then start with a new email. Don't rely on going back because you're lazy to type in the new contact address or type in something new in your subject. Don't go back and look for the old email that doesn't have any bearing on what you're now going to talk about. Always start with a new email and add your contacts to your address book so you can add them to a new email with one click. Once you do this and invest just a little bit of time in the beginning, then that means you don't have to go back and look lazy and try to find the last email that came in to reply on the back of. So this is something else that really creates an impression. Whether you are lazy or whether you actually just type in the new contact and talk about a new subject in a fresh and new email. So be careful about you how you use previous email for new correspondence. Really don't do it. Use new correspondence in a fresh way first. When you come to replying to emails, the next basic part of email etiquette is how you actually reply and whether you edit replies. Don't just hit the reply button and start typing and not consider the body of the content that was in the previous email. It's good to go through the previous email. You can highlight some points that you wish to respond to and this shows that you are thinking. This shows that you are looking at it point by point by point you are being very clear in your communications as well. So in your response, only respond to those things that really are relevant. And don't include headers and signature files that clutter up everything. Just take those out. You really need to make sure everything is clear and the point-by-point -point reply, which is the best way of replying, keeps the conversation of the email on track. So there are very few misunderstandings. People will know that you've thought about your reply. People will know that you're not lazy. People will know that you're interested in communicating clearly. And so the way you edit your replies is going to reflect your image of professionalism. That's what it's all about, remember. That is what it's all about. 
And common courtesy, another basic of email etiquette, is certainly something you do need to be mindful of. When you greet the other person by email, hello, hi, good day, thank you, sincerely, best regards. All those introductions that you use and all the ways that you sign off an email or a letter are the essence of professional communication. And they should also be used in your business email communications as well. Try to think of a way that you prefer to sign off that is perhaps your personal signature. Think business letterhead always in this though. Don't get too friendly. Don't say bye-bye. That's very loose and very familiar. That's too friendly for a business email. So try to gather for yourself ways that you can sign off that reflect your professionalism and make you sound very businesslike, but also friendly as well. So think about this. Maybe there are one or two ways that you personally like to sign off each time. I do know that a friend of mine always signs off by saying cheers, even in business, because we have a very long established business relationship. He signs off cheers, which in my culture means uh, see you later. See you, it's a very positive way of saying goodbye, and it's a very uh, natural way for our particular relationship in the business dealings that we have. So that is a preference that we use, and I also reflect that in the way I sign off to him. So these things become rather personalized. The way you begin your introduction and the way you sign off. Courtesy in introductions and sign-offs also mean that you make the effort to communicate as an educated adult. When you type these sign-offs as well. Type in full sentences with proper structure. Not all caps and not all small case. Remember there needs to be punctuation as well. And after you introduce yourself or your email, dear so and so, then you put a comma. So punctuation and grammar is very, very important in your introductions as well as your sign-offs. You are educated. You need to reflect this, and the way you spell and use the caps or smaller case will exactly reflect your communication skills. So remember, this is creating the first impression. If you do it the right way, then you're creating a professional impression, and that's what you want. If you do it the wrong way, and use all capital letters or use smaller case or no punctuation just in your introductions and your sign-offs, this will not instill confidence in your business partners or business colleagues. It will not encourage them to want to do business with you because you look slack, you look lazy, you don't know about business communication. Remember, people start to judge you. People start to get a perception about you, all from the way you communicate in emails. And let's take a look at the next basic, the final basic in business email etiquette. Keep your signature file, which is at the bottom of your email, to no more than five or six lines which means that you're not being seen as superior or having an ego. I have seen some signature files that are 10 lines long with great big blocks in them and colors and exclamation marks and loads of numbers, etc. and a lot of information that really is not necessary. And it looks actually over the top. It looks too heavy. It's loaded with information that's not really needed. So as a general rule, and one that is a very important rule to follow in signature files, limit your signature to your website link, 
your company name and slogan perhaps, your phone number, and include your website because that is where the recipient can get all the kinds of information they need, all the other contact details about you, they can get it from there. You don't need to put all that information in your signature file. People can go to the website to get that. If they need to contact you any other way than by email or giving you a call on the phone. It really does look messy when you think about it at the bottom of your email if you've loaded it with too much information. And also, don't forget to include the HTTP when including your website address within your own emails and your signature file to ensure that the URL is recognized and it's a clickable regardless of the user's software, etc. So if you enter it that way in your email, then the recipient can simply click on immediately from your email. They don't need to go into Internet Explorer, etc. to do that. They can just click directly and there up comes the information from your website. So keep it simple. A lot of these things, particularly with signature files, are meant to be kept simple. And that way, you're creating a very, very good impression. Even if you were to write and have a signature file on an actual paper letterhead, at the bottom, do you always cloud it up with so much information that it looks top heavy? So the same applies to email signature files. And the less that's on the bottom, the clearer and more pleasing that is to the eye when someone is looking at the email as well. So simplicity is a general rule to follow here. Signature files and all of the other components that we've just talked about form the basic part of business email etiquette. So these particular issues are all very important issues and they will allow your business communications to become easily understood and people will see that you are able to master these issues and therefore you will reflect a very good image. So take the time to master these points. They're very valid points. So go through each one of them following this program and look at the way you are sending your emails. Take a look at the subject field. Take a look at the to and from field. Take a look at the CC and the blind CC field. How have you entered details? What's your habit? What's your usual pattern? Take a look at the uh, signature files. Take a look at all of these things, the formatting. Take a look at how you introduce and how you sign off. These basic etiquette points will really demonstrate whether you are professional or not professional in your business communications. So when you are trying to make new business relationships and when you are trying to also compound the existing good relationships that you do have, your level of professionalism and your level of courtesy that you show in your email communications will always win clients over the competition who may perhaps not be as well uh, informed or as knowledgeable as you in email communications. So you are always competing, remember. There are other people writing to your customers. There are other people wanting their business. So you need to make sure your communications are polished, are excellent in terms of the content and the way you approach them. So when it comes to doing business, regardless of the type of communication used, it could be email as we're discussing, it could be the old-fashioned letter, which is not old-fashioned really, it is used a lot. It could be written communication, 
in form of letter. It could be telephone communication. It could be conference calling. It could be anything, any mode of communication. In that communication, professionalism and courtesy never go out of style. They are always the main ingredients. They are always what people look for. And that, indeed, is always what you do need to reflect. Complete professionalism and complete courtesy. We have now run through the basics of email etiquette. And this is just the start of how to really be professional in your email communications. I do hope, as I have said, that you now take a look at yourself, the way you're emailing, and go through the next parts of the program with me in much more detail about all the other aspects that come into email correspondence and making you and your business look very, very professional and continue to be successful. Thank you for your attention.